One of the things that you and I have to know about our God is that the God that you and I serve is a jealous God. And He will not allow any rivals whatsoever to compete with His worship. And that is why it is very important as believers in Christ to always give God the due worship that He rightly deserves. Let us make sure in our hearts that we are not worshiping any other thing except God. We should not be worshiping money. We should not be worshiping our jobs, our careers, our businesses. We should not be worshiping our relationships. But rather, God and God alone deserves our worship. John Calvin said that the heart that we have is a factory of idols. And he is correct in saying so. And even uh, those who are believers in Christ have a tendency to somehow have things that has become idols in their hearts. And I'd like to cite a specific example with John the Beloved himself. John the Beloved was shown great and mighty revelations, which were written down, of course, in the book of Revelation. Things that belong to the future have been revealed to John the Beloved. And we are blessed, of course, that we have the book of Revelation to somehow equip us and guide us um, in understanding and comprehending things that belong to the future, which should somehow bring about a proper response. Now, John the Beloved, of course, received uh, some of those revelations through an angel. And in one particular occasion, interestingly, he was tempted to bow down before an angel. I'd just like to share to you in Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. It says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Now remember, we're, we're not talking about an immature believer here. We're not talking about uh, somebody who um, is not um, uh, grounded in the word of God. We're talking about an apostle. And not just any other apostle, we're talking about the apostle John. And yet, because he saw the glory of this angel, he was tempted to worship this angel. And the angel said to him, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book, worship God. Again, this is the message I believe that we need to hear over and over again. At times, we are polishing certain idols in our hearts. And we are, at times, unaware that there are certain things that we have placed on the same level as God. Remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said, you cannot serve God and mammon. We can only serve one master. And that master we should worship and serve. So we rise now and let's worship the Lord. Noise around the earth, lift up. 
your voices before the King of Kings Before the King of Kings In His steadfast love and His faithfulness He has come for us to say Sing praise to our God the Father Sing praise to Jesus Christ the Son
Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Our sermon can also be heard over DYFR FM 98.7 every Saturday and Sunday at 8 p.m. Good news, brothers and sisters, Enough is Enough is making a comeback in our church right now. And we are selling it again at 275 pesos here in our church. And you can get a copy right now and share it among your friends. Good news once again for those who want to grow in their understanding of scriptures. IBI International Bible Institute is once again offering some courses. And if you desire to join us in some of the courses that we have which are pre-recorded, we would like you to make inquiries with the numbers that are flashed on the screen. Or better still, you can visit our IBI office for inquiries every Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. We'd also like to thank our partners and those who are our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-0000068-00. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234811. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click Give and then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless. The title of today's sermon is The Fast That God Sees. We will take our text from Matthew 6, verses 16 to 18. This is part one of a two-part series. Shall we rise from our seats and let's read Matthew 6, 16 to 18. It says, Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Let's bow our heads in prayer at this time. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you for this blessed opportunity once again to worship you during this Lord's Day. Indeed, O oh God, you're worthy of all praise and worship. And we thank you, dear Lord, as we are now in 2021 and we are still experiencing your faithfulness, your preservation, your goodness, your grace, your provisions, your mercy in our lives, O oh God. Indeed, O oh God, you are faithful to your people 
through and through. And so once again, we ask your grace, your blessing upon the study of your word. Allow this word today to become part of our lives and our spiritual disciplines. And we ask, Lord, that you might minister to us in a very special way through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Lord, whatever is going to be achieved today, we will give you back the glory, the praises, and the thanks. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen and amen. Now today we will be talking about a subject matter uh, which I believe somehow has been lost in this 21st century. Fasting is a major spiritual discipline that was not only practiced in the Old Testament, but it was likewise practiced heavily in the New Testament as well. However, when we talk about fasting, most especially nowadays in the 21st century, it seems like people are, are at a loss as to its meaning and as to uh, how it can be applied in so far as our spiritual lives are concerned. And God has somehow placed a burden in my heart to reintroduce fasting and prayer to us. In fact, when I survey the past 36 years of my ministry here in Cebu, I could say that fasting was very much a spiritual discipline, not only of myself, but also of the entire church. Every holy week, we go through a two or three day uh, period of fasting and prayer. And then once a month, we also have our once a month congregational prayer and fasting. So this has been part of the life and the ministry of Living Word Christian Church. And somehow I pray that, most especially for our young people, I pray that the spiritual discipline might somehow be recaptured and uh, so that you and I might be able to derive great benefits once again from this. You see, fasting is not just a, uh, a spiritual performance, as some people would think, because this was what was seen, most especially with the Pharisees during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not mere performance. There is power that you and I can derive out of prayer and fasting. So instead of diving into the text and uh, trying to exposit the verses of Scripture to you for our uh, better understanding of what Jesus intended for uh, this passage, what I would like to do really is to give you a primer on prayer and fasting. So what you and I will be doing today in our study is I would like to give you the what and the why of prayer and fasting. It's going to be a sort of primer. And here I would like to give you its definition and the benefits that we can derive out of it. Now, in part two of our series, which will be next weekend, we will be tackling the how. So today we will be doing the what and the why of fasting. And next weekend we will talk about the how of fasting and prayer. So let's begin our study today. And first of all, allow me to give you a negative definition of fasting and prayer. First of all, it is not a hunger strike. Now, over the years, some people have used the hunger strike for their own political agendas. And it has been quite effective, most especially in somehow grabbing the attention of the major populace. And it has resulted in some political changes. And so just to name a few hunger strikes uh, that we have had in recent history, first of all, we had uh, Dick Gregory, who fasted and prayed, uh, I'm sorry, not fasted and prayed, but did a hunger strike, rather, because of the Vietnam War. And um, again, uh, this had a great uh, effect on the major populace of the United States of America. That is why there were some people who were really against the Vietnam War. 
And of course, there was Max Wing, perhaps uh, the first in history to starve himself to death for a political purpose. He has been followed by a number of IRA members who also died in, um, in a hunger protest. Then you have the example of Mahatma Gandhi, of course. And of course, he is a well-known political figure. And we know that uh, he was well-known not only in India, but as well as all over the world. And so his voice was heard because he likewise did a hunger strike. And then, of course, in our own country, we had Ninoy uh, Benigno Aquino, who also did a hunger strike as well. So as much as a lot of people have gone on a hunger strike, we need to know that there is no religious nor spiritual purpose to it. It was mainly to grab the attention of a lot of people and to move people into certain actions politically. So again, when we talk about fasting, we are not talking about a hunger strike. Secondly, it is not dieting. Now, uh, if you would like to do a diet, I suggest that you probably enroll in a program like Slimmer's World or anything like that for that matter, if that is the purpose. So again, uh, dieting has no religious and spiritual purpose. The purpose is really probably to, to lose weight and for physical fitness. Again, uh, this is not what you and I are talking about. Also, fasting is not also done for health purposes. Now, although fasts have been scientifically proven to be healthy for the body, in fact, uh, there have been studies that have been made among the Russian doctors and Russian scientists. And this is what they discovered as they prescribed a 30-day fast. They had observed that there were some major illnesses that were practically healed just by going through a period of fasting. And... Um, of course, in our case, um, we find that if we go on, on fasting, we have uh, the elimination of toxins uh, through, uh, through a lot of drinking of water, but at the same time, no food intake. Uh, this eliminates a lot of, um, a lot of uh, toxins, which are really very harmful to our body. So again, when we talk about uh, fasting, in a biblical sense, we're not talking about a hunger strike, we are not talking about dieting, and we are not talking about using it for health uh, purposes. So what is fasting uh, based on what we find in the Bible? Well, let's talk about the positive definition of it. It is abstinence from food for spiritual reasons as led by the Spirit of God, and is always linked to prayer. Now, there are two kinds of uh, prayer and fasting. There is what we call the partial fast. And in the partial fast, we could be uh, thinking about not having food intake, for example, for a number of hours, or a number of meals, or a number of days. But of course, in a partial fast, we, we do take water. Now, in other cases, uh, in the partial fast, some people uh, decide to abstain, for example, from meat or from certain types of food, or they just miss or skip a breakfast. So this is what we might call a partial fast. In the case of a total fast, you have somebody who does not drink water, and also food. Now, the most that you can last, of course, without water and prevent dehydration would be about three days. And so, again, the purpose by which this is done is for obtaining the favor and the grace of God. So it's always linked to prayer. Now, what are the reasons for fasting? And so here we go into the why of fasting. Now, first that we find in the scripture is that fasting was used for times of national trouble and repentance. 
In Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now, on the 24th day of this month, the sons of Israel assembled with fasting, in sackcloth and with dirt upon them. The descendants of Israel separated themselves from all the foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And so here we find that one of the purposes uh, why the people of Israel fasted was it was used as a sign of repentance, as a sign that they were confessing their iniquities before the Lord. But at the same time, because of fasting, they were somehow trying to ask the favor of God so that God might somehow bring his favor upon the nation of Israel once again. Now, I believe that most especially in our case, since we are going through a pandemic crisis and so many things are happening that are unprecedented and we're navigating through this, I would like to suggest that we not only come before the Lord in prayer, but also in fasting. And fasting somehow is a way by which we humble ourselves before the Lord and we are crying out to God in desperation. And in that desperation, we are saying, Lord, we are willing to sacrifice a meal or two or, or sacrifice several days without meals, Lord, because we are earnest. We are earnestly seeking your face. We are desperate. We want answers. We want you to solve our national problems. And I believe that this is something that we somehow need to instill among ourselves, in the church most especially. And I sense that there is a lack of desperation, a lack of earnestness. And I think many of us are now beginning to take this pandemic crisis lightly and even casually. And because of that, I believe that we need to come before the Lord and ask His grace, not only for ourselves, but even for our own country. Now, a second reason for fasting is this. Since fasting is always connected with prayer, a spirit-led fast is an effective means of dealing with temptation. And this is something that we have seen as well in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, Jesus being our Savior had to be tested. He had to be tested in the matter of holiness. He had to be tested in the matter of spirituality. And he had to be tested in the matter of obedience. Now, if the Lord Jesus Christ had somehow been tainted, marred, or soiled by even a small iota of sin, it would have disqualified him from becoming the Messiah, or from being the Messiah. And likewise, if the Lord Jesus Christ disobeyed the Lord, even in one instance, that would already disqualify him from being our Messiah. So in other words, the Lord Jesus Christ had to be tested. And Jesus knew that he was going to be tested. And this happened in... Uh, in the wilderness, in the mountains. And the Lord Jesus Christ went into a period of fasting. To be exact, he went through a 40-day fast. And I would like to think that this was part of his spiritual preparation so that when he faced the temptations head-on, he would be victorious. And of course, this was a way by which Jesus was also showing us an example of preparing ourselves, most especially when you and I are facing a difficult challenge, a difficult spiritual challenge. And so let us go to Matthew 4, beginning at verse 1. We are told here, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now the word tempted here is... A, a very broad term, and it could mean that Jesus was being tested. And again, the testing here was very important to prove that he was qualified to be the Messiah. 
So he was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. In verse 2, it says, And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But notice Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In this particular case, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ was being tempted with the lust of the flesh. Why? Because he was hungry at this time. And so the temptation, of course, after 40 days of fasting and prayer, is to, to have a meal, to somehow um, alleviate the pain of uh, hunger. And of course, uh, I have also experienced this as well. Uh, the most that I've gone through in terms of fasting would be seven days. And um, I fasted seven days about twice. And in those periods, I tell you, although there are times you, you would be able to overcome uh, the hunger or the hunger pangs or the hunger pains, the, the torment of not being able to eat meals is, is really real. And somehow you, you start thinking about food and thinking about when you could break the fast so that you could have a meal. But Jesus was prepared. He had fasted and prayed. And he answered using the word of God. And again, he said, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now the devil was not through with him. And so in verse 5 it says, Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command you, he'll, He will command rather His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now, in this particular case, what uh, the devil was tempting Jesus with was the pride of life. And the question is, if you are really the Son of God. In other words, uh, the devil was trying to tempt Jesus into trying to prove himself that he was really the Son of God. Again, the temptation here had to do with the pride of life. Jesus, again, was very much prepared. And you will notice here a little difference. Uh, Satan was trying to use the word of God against the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus obviously knew the word of God and knew its proper settings and proper context. And he knew that what the devil was doing was he was twisting the word of God at this time. And Jesus was ready to give him, to give the devil, the proper understanding, the proper context of this passage of Scripture. And so, he answers him in verse 7 and says, Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, the devil was wrong in putting the Lord Jesus Christ into this, uh, into this situation of temptation because, again, you are not supposed to uh, put the Lord your God to the test. Once again, Jesus was prepared. Now, in verse 8, it says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and began to minister to him. Now, what was happening here? The temptation actually was for Jesus to receive the kingdom. Now, notice here. The Lord Jesus Christ, being the Davidic king, and the promised Messiah was supposed to uh, was supposed to gain dominion over all of God's creation, but that dominion had to go through the path of the cross. And what Jesus, or rather, what the devil was trying to do here 
was to offer the kingdom without Jesus having to go through the cross. And so here, the Lord Jesus Christ was equal or more than equal to the temptation. He was saying, no. Uh, in effect, he was saying, I'm going to go through the cross. And he says that uh, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I will never, ever worship you, Satan. And so again, here we find that Jesus was victorious and therefore the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to the Lord Jesus Christ. So once again, what we see here is the Lord Jesus Christ was prepared not only because he knew the word of God, but because he went through the spiritual discipline of prayer and fasting. Now, a third reason is self-humiliation before God, often in connection with confession to avert God's wrath. Allow me to read to you Jonah chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. Now the context here is that Nineveh was already ripe for God's judgment. And uh, Jonah was tasked by the Lord to give a message of uh, God's judgment, which would shortly take place upon Nineveh. But notice here, this pagan nation, and this is the amazing thing, this pagan nation responded by fasting and praying before the Lord. In other words, they humbled themselves. You know, one of the things I think that needs to be reintroduced in the minds of people is that God is in the business of judging nations. And this is something that we have seen even in the Old Testament. The entry of Israel into the land of Canaan was a judgment upon the Canaanite nations. The deliverance of Israel from Egypt was actually a judgment upon Egypt and also the gods of Egypt. And of course, the exile of the nation of Israel, both to Assyria and likewise Babylon, were judgments of God upon that nation. And I believe that there is something uh, that we need to be able to reintroduce once again to many um, believers. Many believers have failed to realize that, that God is in the business of judging nations and he has the right to do so. Because it is God who made these nations. It is God who created these boundaries. It is God who created the languages. It is God who created these people groups. And they are all accountable before God. And Romans chapter 1 teaches us that when you exchange the glory of God for an idol, for something that is much lesser than, than God, then the wrath of God will come upon you. And that is why even John MacArthur, in one of his teachings, declared very succinctly that he believes that the nation of America is under judgment. And you know, if you ask my personal opinion, insofar as the Philippines is concerned, I believe our nation is under the judgment of God as well. And how do we know that it is under judgment? Because all of the sins that bring in the wrath of God that we find in Romans chapter 1 are being committed by our nation blatantly and brazenly without any, without any shame. We are not blushing at the sins that you and I are committing. And therefore, I believe, yes, that our country is under judgment. And even the church, I believe, is under judgment because we have brought shame and disrepute to the name of the Lord. And that is why I believe 
that more than at any other period of time, I believe we need to bring back the discipline of fasting and prayer to cry out to God earnestly, to desperately seek His face, that God might show mercy upon our nation and even upon the church itself. Another reason for fasting is for some special petition before the Lord out of anguish, danger, or desperation. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 and 4, it says, Now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the Mayonites, came to war against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea out of Aram, and behold, they are in Hazazon Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Now, this was a time of a great national threat. Several nations were now threatening to destroy Israel. And what was the response of Jehoshaphat? What was the response of Judah? Their response was to come before the Lord in humility by humbling themselves through prayer and fasting. Why? Because they knew that without the help of God, they would be destroyed. Without the help of God, they would cease to exist as a nation. The enemy was far, far stronger than themselves. And therefore, they knew that their only hope was God. And that is why they desperately cried out to God by using one of the spiritual disciplines, which is prayer and fasting. And you know, right now, we know the situation in the national capital region. The hospitals are overwhelmed. And some people are dying in tents. Some people are dying in ambulances. Why? Because the hospital, the emergency rooms and uh, the hospitals are full of patients. And therefore, they can no longer accommodate people. And these people have to wait in tents or even in cars and ambulances. And, and we know the horror stories. People are dying in tents, in the cars, in the ambulances. And right now, people are even going to other cities. People in Metro Manila are now going to Cavite and, and Bulacan and many other um, nearby cities. Why? Because the hospitals in the NCR region are full. And guess what? Even Cebu right now is willing to, to give a helping hand. We're going to to lend our doctors and our nurses. I believe they just left uh, yesterday or today to help out the people in NCR who are overwhelmed. The doctors are overwhelmed. The nurses are overwhelmed. And now people, and I was listening to one interview of one mayor, and he was saying that people now are really afraid. And he says, 2021 is far worse than 2020. And many people, he said, are dying right now. And so again, are we desperate? Shouldn't we be crying out to God? Maybe even fasting and praying? Maybe even just a meal or two? I don't think it is too much of a sacrifice if we, for example sacrifice our breakfast or our lunch, if only to curry the favor of God. I pray that this is something that we might do. Now, another thing is to be able to prepare for an important task and for guidance. In Acts 13, verse 2, it says, While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. 
Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now notice here, Barnabas and Saul, and together with the entire church, they went into fasting and prayer. Why? Because they wanted guidance. They were asking the Lord, Lord, what are we going to do next? And somehow I feel that the church um, lacks sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. And do we need the Holy Spirit to guide us specifically? Most definitely. Now you and I know that the Bible gives us a general guidance for living. And so we don't have to guess matters relating to morality or relating to spirituality or ecclesiology or many other things that relate to a general pattern or a general guidance as to how we as believers in Christ are to live our lives or how the church itself is to conduct itself. We know that. We know the core values of the church. We know the philosophy of ministry. We know the mission objectives. We know how we should live out our lives as believers in Christ. We don't need to ask God for guidance in those things. But most definitely, if you happen to be a pastor, you need guidance. Lord, where are you calling me? Lord, where should I pastor? Lord, what should I do in this situation? Obviously, those things, the Bible will not tell you. The Bible will not tell you to, for example, go to Indonesia to become a missionary or to go to New Zealand and start a pastorate. This is something that comes upon us as a strong conviction because we are sensitive to the working of the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes, sensitivity to the Holy Spirit will come because we seek the face of God through prayer and fasting. And this is what happened in the case of Barnabas and Saul. That is why here, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they were given a proper direction as to where they were supposed to go. And we need those kinds of specific directions, like whom am I supposed to marry? Who is going to be my lifetime partner? Um, what job am I supposed to take? Or what course should I take when I go to college? Now, these things, these decisions are, are very, very important decisions. I mean, we cannot simply think um, randomly or decide randomly in regard to these things as if it is a matter of multiple choice A, B, C, D and that whatever choice we are to make it does not have any bearing. I believe God has a specific will for us and those decisions are very crucial and those decisions that we need to make are very important in the matter of charting our destiny. And that is why we have to humble enough and fast and pray before the Lord. Now, in the next section of our study today, I'd like to be able to share to you the results of fasting. This has been broken down into 10 categories by Chatham, who was a scholar in biblical and historical fasting. And here are some of the results. One, one of the, some of the things that happen when you go through fasting and prayer. One is self-discipline and spiritual growth. There is an awareness of sins and our shortcomings. And this happens, why? Because, again, we become sensitive to the Holy Spirit, sensitive to His convictions, uh, at times, we are unaware that we are polishing some idols in our hearts. And oftentimes, we have those blind spots. And it is when we fast and pray and humble ourselves before the Lord that somehow uh, God impresses upon our hearts or God convicts us about specific sins in our lives or idols that we need to give up. That happens when you and I pray 
and fast. Now, likewise, another example of a result of fasting would be church growth. I recall the story of a pastor who humbled himself before God and fasted and prayed for about 40 days. And he was seeking some direction from the Lord. And the Lord somehow impressed in his heart that his prayers had been heard and that God would reveal very soon where he was supposed to pastor. And so after this period of fasting and prayer, the Lord had somehow impressed in his heart that he was to pastor a church which did not seem to be quite promising because it almost became defunct. And in truth, there were only about 27 members in that church. Not very promising. And so the Lord had somehow instructed him that this was the church that he was going to pastor. And, and interestingly enough, you know, what had happened was uh, he went to the overseer and told the overseer that he was willing to pastor this church if he was permitted to do so. Incidentally, this church was earning, I think, something like $1,200 to $1,500 a year. So not only did it have a small membership, it also had very little finances. And so if you were a pastor um, and you were looking for the best possible places to pastor, probably this will be the least choice that you would make. But the Lord was very clear in so far as his instruction to this pastor. And you know what happened? When he pastored this church, after only two years, the church had grown into almost uh, 3,000 members, from 27 members to about 3,000 members. And guess what? Their finances reached to something like $100,000 a year. And so again, how did this come about? This came about because of prayer and fasting. This person would not have pastored this church had he not been instructed after a time of uh, fasting and prayer before the Lord. A third reason is, you know, when you fast and pray, you may have your financial needs supplied. There was a missionary, or rather a, a pastor, or I'm sorry, a missionary, who was about uh, 40 years old. He was in his 40s. He was a young minister with his wife. And so they went into the mission field. And when they went into the mission field, initially their missions organization was supplying them uh, the necessary funding. And so they were fine. They were doing all right. But after a few months, the organization had to tell them that the funds had dried out and they could no longer support this missionary and his wife. So what this missionary did was he went into a period of fasting and prayer and sought the face of God and said, Lord, Lord, unless you provide for us, Lord, this mission, this mission job is done and we might have to return back home. I mean, probably those were the things that he, were, he was praying before the Lord. And you know, the interesting part was this. After a period of fasting and prayer, his, his friend, which he had known way back when they were quite young, remembered him and signed a check. And this check was given to him. And his friend said, you know, I just remembered you and signed this check for you and your wife. And later on, several other people were, were touched by the Lord. And somehow all their needs or their financial needs were met by the Lord. And again, the Lord used fasting and prayer in this case. Another um, blessing that could come about with uh, fasting and prayer is spontaneous revivals. Now, many of you have heard Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards is greatly respected in the reform circles and greatly respected, of course, by so many people. And the reason why he is greatly respected and revered is because of the many 
spontaneous revivals that had taken place under his ministry. And the most famous, of course, uh, preaching material that Jonathan Edwards preached was sinners in the hands of an angry God. And we are told of the story wherein um, the people uh, were so afraid that they would go to hell, they were holding on to their seats, afraid that they might go to hell. Now that began a series of spontaneous revivals. Now what people do not know is this. Before he preached that sermon, he had fasted and prayed for three days. Once again, he fasted and prayed for three days before he preached that sermon. Oftentimes, we think that we can, we can preach sermons with the anointing and the unction of God without really seeking the face of the Lord. Well, friends, here's where we see that sanctification is synergistic. Salvation is monergistic. It is all the work of God. We have no participation when it comes to our, um, when it comes to our own salvation. But when you talk about sanctification, it is synergistic. We need to cooperate with God. We need to participate with God. We need to pray to God. And may I add, we need to fast before the Lord. Now, another thing that happened, or another thing that can happen would be miracles of healing. There was a man and a woman who were... Um, healed of God, uh, of, of cancer. And how, did, how were they healed by the Lord with, uh, um, I'm sorry, it was not cancer, but they had bleeding ulcers. They had bleeding ulcers. One man, in fact, had bleeding ulcers for uh, 15 years. And they were healed through prayer and fasting. Yes, God still performs miracles, and sometimes He can use fasting in that case. Now, another um, reason for, or another blessing that can come uh, through prayer and fasting would be miracles of salvation. Now, let me tell you one story of a miracle of salvation. There was one father who was always praying and fasting for his son. His son was not a, a believer. And, you know, the sad thing, of course, is that sometimes um, even godly parents, Christian parents, can have children who are not believers. And uh, last time around, I was talking to my son, TJ, and he shared to me a video of one of John Piper's sons who is an atheist. And um, in that video, he was uh, speaking um, bad words. He was cursing and cussing. And, and he was talking about bad things about Christianity and, and all of that. And my heart just went out um, to John Piper. I mean, John Piper is one of, those pastors whom we greatly, greatly respect. His preachings and his books have impacted so many lives. And it is so sad to, to see his son doing something that is contrary to what he's doing. His son is destroying what his father is trying to build. So anyway, there was this father who had a son who was not a believer and he fasted and prayed for his son. And one time, this son was riding a plane. Remember, he was in a plane. He was not in a church. And even while he was in a plane, nobody was sharing the gospel to him. There was no Bible to read at that time. But you know what happened? All of a sudden, in that plane, without any premeditated um, plan or action, this man just came under the heavy conviction of the Lord. And right then and there in that airplane, he confessed his sins, asked for forgiveness, and received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. My dear brothers and sisters, do you have members in your family 
who are not yet believers? May it be that one of the things that you might want to do to be able to bring your relatives into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ is prayer and fasting. I would highly, highly recommend that. Now remember that the Lord Jesus Christ himself said that when the bridegroom is taken, and that's referring to Jesus Christ, when the bridegroom is taken, we will be fasting and praying. And you and I know that the Lord Jesus Christ has ascended on high. And therefore, I believe fasting and prayer should, is, should still be very much a part of the New Testament pattern of living in the church. Another reason or another blessing that we find uh, for fasting is that church problems can be solved. And um, let me share it to you. Um, I've been exposed in Korea, of course. Uh, my wife and I stayed there for about a month. We visited all the Kido ones. The Kido one, of course, is the prayer mountains. And you know, one of the things that I learned with problem pastors that they had, those who have become problem pastors are always sent to the prayer mountains. Isn't that interesting? One of the things that the pastors, the problem pastors are required to do is to go to the Kido ones, go to the prayer mountains to fast and pray. And you know what? Many of them have come out of those uh, experiences and they are people who have changed. I recall one overseer who saw so many problems in, in a church. Many of the ministers were problematic. The church was problematic. You know what he did? He, he, um, he decreed that the church would go through a period of fasting every Tuesday. Every Tuesday. And you know what? After several months of fasting every Tuesday, there was a radical change that took place among the pastors as well as the whole church. Fasting does a lot of good things. Another reason why we should fast and pray is for divine wisdom and direction. Uh, there's the story of a Georgia pastor who wanted to do uh, a work in a particular nearby town. He wanted to plant a church. And he needed direction. So he brought with him four or five people in the team, and they sought direction from the Lord. And the pastor in particular, during a time of prayer, saw a vision. And by the way, this was the very first time that he saw a vision. So he was not really sure what to do with this vision. But in this vision, he saw a, a particular house, and this house was going to be the beginning point of that ministry or that church that they were going to plant. Now, because he, he experienced this for the very first time, he did not tell the members of his team that he had seen a vision. So he simply said, let's go to the town, let's go around, and, and let's see, let's see a location. Let's try to look for a location where... Our, our witnesses uh, or the, the Spirit of God would bear witness that this would be the location where we would begin. And what happened was they went into a particular location. Somehow their hearts were warm that this must be the place where they could begin to plant a church. And so what the pastor did was he tried to look over that particular Location and see if he could see a house which was, uh, was similar to the vision that he saw. And interestingly enough, he saw a house that he had seen in his vision. So they went to that place, he knocked at the door, and there was a woman who was invalid who said that she had been longing for a Bible study to be started in her house. 
And so they were welcomed into the house. And interestingly enough, uh, in that house was also a couple. And this couple had been praying uh, for, for a Bible study as well. And so they were able to begin a work there. And then they were able to find a hotel in which they could stay for some time. And the interesting thing was the owner gave them board and lodging, free board and lodging, and even allowed them to use the facilities, some of the function rooms, to be used for um, any church service. So, you know, these stories are amazing stories. And these stories had been, you know, had been birthed or came about because of prayer and fasting. Now, another reason for um, prayer and fasting is for acts of divine judgment. Uh, there was this employee who was a hard worker, who was a believer, and he was working under a very uh, difficult boss. He was assigned to do project plans, but the boss or the supervisor that he was um, working for was very critical of him and was practically throwing out all the hard work that he was doing for, for several days or weeks. And so he was greatly oppressed, and so he approached one of his fellow employees who happened to be a Christian and he said, let's, let's come before the Lord in in prayer and fasting. And by the way, they were not praying that something bad would, would happen to the boss. They were simply casting their cares before the Lord. And the sad part is that God judged that uh, employer and um, the boss had a heart attack and he died. And in place of him was a very kind and very understanding supervisor. Now, again, notice the balance. These people were not, these two believers were not praying for, for something bad to happen. But then sometimes in prayer before the Lord, God in his infinite wisdom chooses to do that which is best for his children. Perhaps the time was ripe for this person to be judged by the Lord. And probably this was not the only sin that he was committing in his life. Now, the last reason why we should go into fasting is that there's always that possibility of a supernatural visitation from the Lord. And in a survey that was done among 265 pastors who went into a period of fasting, this is what was discovered in this period of prayer and fasting. 97% felt greater intimacy with the Lord. 97%. 76% became mentally and spiritually alert. And 51% experienced supernatural phenomena. So, um, again, these could be reasons why you may want to go through a time of fasting and prayer. And again, during this season of great difficulty, great trouble, national, ecclesiology-wise, uh, individual-wise, family-wise, we're encountering so many troubles on many fronts. And I am afraid that Christendom is taking this lightly. Don't you think that God is bringing across a very crucial and very critical message to us? And shouldn't you and I implore the mercies of God through great earnestness and great desperation? And could it be that God is asking us to fast and pray and seek the face of God? You know, once a month, the Lord has uh, somehow impressed upon my heart to fast and pray. And uh, it's not a very long um, uh, period of fasting. I'm just skipping a meal. And the point is, 
God is looking for desperation, earnestness, humility on our part. And today, we have talked about the what and the why. And I hope that it has convinced you on prayer and fasting. Next weekend, we will be talking about the how. God bless you. And let's come before the Lord in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, so many bad things are happening in our country. And so many of us are losing our friends, our loved ones. We're losing people, Lord, who are close to us. And Lord, we know that these are desperate times. And desperate times call for desperate measures. We ask, O oh God, that you might call many people into intercession. And we are praying that you will recruit many more prayer warriors. We ask, O oh Lord, that many believers will go back to the disciplines of Bible reading, Bible meditation, much prayer, and also fasting. Lord, we pray that, that you will convict a lot of people to go into a period of fasting and prayer. And we know that you are a prayer answering God, and we will trust you and believe you. Thank you for the sermon today, and thank you for what it will accomplish. We also thank you that we could give our tithes, our grace gifts, and our offerings. Lord, use them for the glory of your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Once again, brothers and sisters, uh, we thank you for joining us in this wonderful Sunday. And my wife and my son, AJ, would like to say hi and goodbye. But please stay with us for this reminder. Hi, this is Pastor Mel Caparos of Living Word Christian Church. One of the things that I've really been very thankful of, most especially in the past uh, three or four years, is being part of OMF Lit as an author. OMF Lit is a mighty instrument that God has used to bless not only our own nation, but likewise other nations as well. Through OMF, the Word of God has gone forth in different parts of this world and in different parts of the Philippines. People have been edified. People have been encouraged. People have been inspired by the many books that OMF Lit has produced and likewise distributed. And I happen to be one of those people whom God has used through uh, OMF Lit to be a blessing to uh, many people, not only here in our country, but even abroad. And through OMF, I was able to write two books. 
One is this book, Enough is Enough, my very first book under OMF Lit. And this book talks about contentment. And this is a book I believe that a lot of people need to be able to read, read through. Why? Because many of us have many problems and some of us have not realized that the problems that we have have come about because of greed, because of envy, because of discontent. And somehow, this book will help you navigate through your spiritual life and your journey so that it can guide you, help you, instruct you on how to be content. You know, there's nothing like a contented life. There is just a stillness and a calmness that you and I will have when you and I are content. We rest in God. We rest in Him because we know He is all-wise and all-loving. A second book that OM, OMF Lit has distributed and produced, of course, for me is this book, More Than Enough. It talks about how to overcome our own trials. And you know, this 2020 and even this 2021 has been filled with so many trials. I mean, it's not just the pandemic crisis. There is unemployment. There's losing our own jobs. There's also the case of uh, uh, losing um, our social you know, life because of the the thing that has caused us to to distance ourselves with each other. And so it has resulted in not only death because of the pandemic crisis. There's some people who committed suicide. There's some people who have done things that they now regret. And again, we need to be able to overcome our trials. This book, More Than Enough, will help you navigate through the trials of life. So please do not forget, enough is enough and more than enough. Thank you, OMF. You are such a blessing to us.